The charity Christian Aid says the 10 worst climate disasters this year have cost $140 billion in insurance claims. Bushfires in Australia caused $5 billion in losses and killed more than a billion wild animals. Well, on the US West Coast, wildfires caused $20 billion worth of damage. Over in China, flooding in the Yangtze River Basin led to $32 billion in losses, but extreme weather events linked to climate change had a disproportionate effect in poorer countries. Six of the ten costliest disasters were in Asia, which was hit by some of the strongest storms on record, and they caused huge human and financial losses in countries that bear little responsibility for global warming, including Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Bhutan. And in East Africa, a massive locust infection invasion, in fact, damaged $8.5 billion worth of crops. Now, the swarm was linked to unusually wet conditions fueled by climate change. Catherine Kramer is the climate policy lead at the charity Christian Aid. She joins me now from London. Good to have you with us uh, on the programme. Uh, can we just begin with the fact that we tend to look at climate change in terms of cost because developed countries seem to see the costs of rebuild and repair escalate, but the cost to poorer nations is as acute, be it their infrastructure is cheaper to deal with. Yes, that's right. I mean, this report did look at the 10 most financially devastating climate-related impacts of 2020. And each, as you say, each of them caused more than a billion dollars of, of losses. But I think it's really important to note that these were the insured losses. And so the figures we have for developing countries where the insurance market is less developed would obviously be significantly higher. And of course, while we list the deaths that each of these uh, storms and floods and fires have caused, it's the impacts for developing countries in loss of life, in terms of loss of livelihood, and even loss of possessions are significantly higher in the sense that if you don't have much and you lose it, then you've lost a lot more than if you have a lot and lose some. Indeed, climate change and its sort of effects have to be dealt with. And we're seeing that the, the new US president-elect wants to lead once again by reaffirming his commitment to climate change protocols. That must be quite a relief. It is very much a relief. I mean, the US is the biggest historical emitter. And without the US, you know, it's very difficult politically to get other countries motivated because we're in a situation of the tragedy of the commons, where climate change is a global problem. And uh, without those that have caused the most damage being on board and those that continue to pollute most being on board, the significant amount of ambition and efforts put forward earlier this month by developing by a lot of developing countries will just be overwhelmed by the carbon emissions if we carry on the fossil economy. In terms of, you might say, the US omission uh, on the public stage this last four years, what has been lost by their lack of leadership that could be regained once uh, President-elect Biden takes office in mid-January? I think it's important to note that the US didn't stall all action. There was a huge amount of effort done by states and cities and a lot of work done subnationally. But without that high level political leadership, it has been a lot harder to, to get that motivation internationally without seeing the leadership from the front by the one, one of the world's biggest polluters. And we're talking about climate change. We're seeing France and other European countries talk about electric car societies by 2040 and Germany by 2030. It's easy, isn't it, for developed countries to say this, but where does that leave the underdeveloped third world nations, mainly, for example, South Asia, where they use rickshaws, for example, uh, and, and petrol and gasoline in their lighting and heating? Well, I think this is where we need global solidarity. And for all the uh, COVID-19 has been a global tragedy. There is the opportunity if we do the rec economic recover recovery packages to do it right. But this needs to be in global solidarity so that we actually have not just countries going, trying to stimulate their own economies, but trying to actually start develop sustainable development across the globe. And that doesn't involve enabling developing countries to leap from, from the fossil economy. We do need to get out of all fossil fuels straight into a renewables economy to transform the transport port sector. And some of that will be done by buying down the costs, by actually getting uh, buying the technologies and as the factories are developed, to, uh, enabling them to be created more in bulk, things like electric vehicles. 
but that transition does need to be supported. And also developing countries need a lot of support for their adaptation to build their resilience against the kinds of climate impacts that we've talked about in this report. Uh, real political face-to-face -face hard talk has been difficult during the COVID pandemic. I mean, there's much to discuss in Glasgow in 2021 at the next sort of COP26 gathering. What would you like to see top of the agenda? Or what, you th what do you think is achievable in terms of some of the top subjects that could be discussed at that meeting? Well, the art of the achievable, of course, is down to political will, and that's in the hands of our political masters, but also in the hands of all of us to try and urge our political masters to act at the level that we need them to act. I think some of the big ticket things that need to be brought forward are greater uh, emissions reductions pledges. Um, we had a summit about two weeks ago that was online where different countries pledged what they would bring forward. But there were many of the larger countries that were noticeable by their absence. Obviously, the US hasn't had its change of government yet. Uh, Japan has come, is due to come forward fairly soon with a new pledge. But we haven't heard anything from other G20 countries like Russia, Saudi Arabia, and some of the other really big economies that really do need to be putting action on the table. But it's not just pledges. We actually need the policies in place to implement them and to really start getting the emissions reductions at the speed that, we can, that they need to be done if we're going to try and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. It's really good to get your insight, Catherine Kramer from Christian Aid. Thanks for joining us from London. Thank you very much.